We tend to think that meditation is something you do when your eyes are closed, when you're sitting in a meditation posture, or when you're doing walking meditation. But the way you live your life has a huge impact on how the form of meditation goes. After all, it's the same mind with the same habits. This is why the Buddha taught restraint of the senses as a foundation for the meditation. In other words, looking after your eyes and ears and nose and tongue and body and the things that go through your mind as you go through the day. When you're looking at something, why are you looking? When you're listening, why are you listening? And when you've looked or listened, what does it do to your mind? That's what it means to restrain the senses, when you realize that simply looking and listening is not a stick drawn to the water that doesn't have any impact. You can see something, it can stick with you for hours. You can hear something and stick with you for days. That might have a bad impact on the mind. If it's developing bad qualities in the mind, then it's going to get in the way of your meditation. And John Lee has a nice image. He says, sometimes our eyes are too big for the things we see, and sometimes they're too small for the things we see. When they're too big, it's that you see something and it's not enough. You want to see more. You want to see this. You want to see that. And just keep on looking. Nothing satisfies you. Then there are things that are too big for your eye. In other words, you keep looking at them, you never get enough. Restraint of the senses is getting the eye and the sights the right size for each other, getting your ears and the sounds the right size for each other. In other words, learning how to listen to something, take what's useful, and then just leave the rest. So that means you have to prepare yourself as you go out through the day. You're going to be looking at things. You have to ask yourself, who's doing the looking? Is greed doing the looking? Is anger doing the looking? Then you've got a problem. You want your mindfulness to be doing the looking. You want your alertness to be doing the looking. Try to develop your discernment to do the looking. The same with your listening. It's not like we're just sitting here perfectly normal with nothing happening, and all of a sudden something comes in and strikes us and either appeals to us or doesn't appeal to us. We're out looking for trouble often, sometimes looking for sounds that we like, sometimes we look for things that we hate. I mean, that's what this hate radio is all about. People actually have to turn it on to hear it. It's interesting, a while back I, we had someone here from Australia doing some transcriptions, and she was transcribing a, a Dharma talk when, in which I had mentioned hate radio, and she put a big question mark next to it. Apparently that's an American phenomenon. But the basic truth is true all over the world, that when we look it's not always innocent. When we listen it's not always innocent. Sometimes we're looking for trouble. Sometimes we're looking for things to compound our lust. Sometimes we're looking for things to compound our anger. And if we're going around looking for lust and anger and these other things, as we go through the day, how are we going to get the mind to settle down when we sit down and close our eyes? Now, this doesn't mean you don't look at all or you don't listen at all, but it does mean that you have to be very careful about your motivation. And if you see that the wrong part of the mind is doing the looking or directing the looking, you've got to do something to change it. So if you see something that gives rise to desire, you have to look at its other side, the side that's not so desirable. This is why we have that contemplation of 32 parts of the body, for contemplating your own body or contemplating other people's bodies, both to get past any feelings of lust and to get past any feelings of pride that your body somehow makes you better than other people's. Same with listening. Sometimes you listen to aggravate your anger. Sometimes you listen to aggravate your desire. You've got to retune your ears. 
something sounds nice, we'll look for the opposite side. If something sounds bad, look for the opposite side. And John Lee has a nice statement about listening to other people's criticism of you. This is when they start t calling you a dog. Remember that dogs don't have any laws. They can do as they like. In other words, when other people are not giving you the chance to impress them, okay, you don't have to go around trying to impress them. That frees you up. If you can listen to things in this way, then you're putting the mind in the right frame to meditate, and so on down for all the other senses. Because the, the motivation that directs the looking is also going to have a huge impact on what you're left with after you've seen. The impression that's made on the mind that gets carried around. And if you let all the unskillful sides of the mind direct you as you're looking or listening, then they're going to be the ones that are strengthened. They're going to be in charge. And when you come to sit and meditate and focus on the breath, or the, the greed and the anger and the aversion, all these other distracting things, they're going to be in charge. And then there's going to be a big battle. This doesn't mean it's going to be impossible to settle down, but you're just making it more and more difficult. So remember, meditation is not just what you do as you're sitting here with your eyes closed or as you go off and do walking meditation. The Pali word, bhavana, to develop, is something that applies all the time. In fact, we're already developing the mind in one direction or another. We may not consciously think of it when we're d developing it in the direction of greed, aversion, and delusion, but that's what we're doing. But we have the choice to develop it in a good direction. After all, this is what wisdom is all about. Sometimes when you hear about Buddhist wisdom, you think about emptiness or not-self or statements about the world. But the Buddha was always talking about wisdom in terms of what you do. And the original question for wisdom is, what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? What when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? We're here to see the impact of our actions and to learn from that so we can do it skillfully. The basic distinctions are the Four Noble Truths and the unskillful cause craving leads to an undesirable result, stress and suffering. Skillful causes or skillful actions, like the path, lead to a desirable result, the end of suffering. It's all about doing. We do mindfulness practice. The qualities we develop are ardency, alertness, and mindfulness. And the wisdom is there in the ardency, trying to do it right, figuring out what's skillful, what's unskillful, and how to do the skillful thing, even when you're not inclined, and how to abandon the unskillful thing when you're more inclined to do the unskillful thing. That's where the wisdom lies. And so it's the same as when we're going around looking at the world and listening to the world, sniffing at the world, tasting the world, we have to keep remember we're doing this. We're not a blank slate into which the world is coming and pushing us around. We're the ones that are out doing the pushing. So look. Who's doing the pushing in the mind as you look, that makes you want to look, and the way you look? And if you see that it's an unskillful member of the committee of your mind, okay, do what you can to counteract it. That way, when the time comes to sit down there, here you are. You're already looking after your mind, rooting out what's unskillful. And sitting down and closing your eyes simply gives you a better chance to do it with a lot more subtlety, with greater depth. But it's all part of the same process, because after all, it's, it's all the same mind. <laughs>